Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Brown, and I'm the senior minister here at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. And uh, I don't know if you have heard, but uh, tomorrow night, the uh, Georgia Bulldogs are playing this unknown team from the University of Alabama. And uh, no, the Crimson Tide are probably as well-known a team as, as any in the country. But the other day, I got a text from a friend of mine, uh, Georgia Payman, and, and he wrote to me, and, and I wanted to share that with you, and this is what he wrote. First of all, it was to a group of us, and he said, two undisclosed recipients. Subject, national championship tickets. Can anyone help out a friend of a friend for me? He has two tickets for the Georgia national championship game on Monday, both box seats. He paid $2,000 each and didn't realize when he bought them that it was going to be on the same day as his wedding. <laughs> if you're interested, he's looking for someone to take his place. It's at the Lutheran Church in Vinings <laughs> at 6 p.m. Her name is Tricia, and she'll be the one in the white dress. <laughs> you know, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that uh, making and keeping commitments matters a lot. But what's most important is making and keeping the right commitments. Now, the Bible understands this. In fact, the Bible uh, indicates time and again that uh, one of the most important commitments that those of us who are Christians can make is to allow our faith in Christ to find expression by being hospitable to other people. For example... If you were to go on the internet right now or this afternoon and you were to just Google the words hospitality in the Bible, you would literally find dozens of references to hospitality in the Bible. Now, this morning, we chose only two for our scripture lesson. The first one you remember came from the lips of Jesus. He said, whoever receives uh, you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, the implication of that for our purposes is that whenever we show hospitality to other people, it is the same thing as if we are showing hospitality to Christ himself and to the God who sent him. And, of course, the other passage that we read this morning came from the hand of the Apostle Paul. He was writing to the Colossian Christians, and, and he told the church, you're always to act wisely towards outsiders. And, and then he went on to kind of explain that a little bit. He said, listen, your speech needs to be gracious, and it needs to be sprinkled with insight. Again, the implication in all of that for us is that the way we treat other people matters deeply. Well, in light of that, this morning I want to invite two people who know a lot about hospitality to come and share with us. Debbie Nixon and Dan Entwistle are, uh, y'all go ahead and come on up here and take a seat. And, and they are executive managing directors at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. And uh, Church of the Resurrection is a 21,000 member United Methodist Church. And uh, they are known not only throughout the, the city of Kansas City, but all across this nation and really in various parts of the world for their tremendous uh, impact when it comes to hospitality in the church. Now, they've been with us all weekend, as, has, as Josh already indicated, and a lot of us have been through a workshop on, on radical hospitality. But they've just... They, I asked them, and they uh, agreed to stay over an extra night and to share with us. And we've got just a limited amount of time this morning, but I wanted you to have an opportunity to hear from them. And so we're just going to spend a few minutes. Would you join me in welcoming them this morning, though, to Dunwoody Methodist Church? Well, Dan and Debbie, you just heard us... Uh, kind of set the stage on this whole subject of, of hospitality. And, and uh, as we think about that word, hospitality, 
can you tell us how you understand that? And more specifically, can, can we talk a little bit about radical hospitality? Well, first, on behalf of Church of the Resurrection uh, and our senior pastor, Adam Hamilton, we want to thank you, uh, Pastor Dan, for the invitation to be here. It's humbling and a deep honor uh, for Dan and I and our congregation, so thank you for that. Um, I also want to just say that we recognize radical hospitality means that we extend ourselves in uh, unexpected ways to others, so I want to congratulate the Atlanta Falcons on your win um, <laughs> last night. And we are so sorry about Kansas and City. And you can uh, give your sympathies to the Kansas City Chiefs fans uh, among us. Uh, but as we think about uh, radical hospitality, the reason that word radical I think is so important and a key word is because it means that we're going to do something extraordinary. We're going to do something beyond what is expected. And uh, my sense is that most people coming to a church would expect a church to be friendly. Mm -hmm. That's what most churches are, are known for is that there's going to be a level of friendliness and often we're really friendly with one another. But when we uh, look to radical hospitality, we're putting ourselves in a posture that we are extending that kind of welcome that strangers among us are first-time visitors and recognizing there may be first-time visitors here today, that this is the kind of church that wants to make all who come comfortable. Uh, thinking of the words of the song that we sing today, no matter what place you're in, all are welcome here. Come as you are. Yeah. So in other words, when people come and, and we shake their hand and we say, uh, we're glad you're here, and then we kind of move on and so forth, that would be hospitality, but radical hospitality would be taking it to the next step and doing, for example, what? I think that uh, there's an, when you think about authenticity, people can um, intuitively, they immediately know whether or not you're just doing this in a perfunctory way. And um, there is a difference when we put ourselves in um, a place where this is a value for us. This is the way we live. And we're looking for opportunities just to encounter others and give them our full attention. Whether maybe it is just a quick hello and I notice that you're here. And then for others, it would be extended further into a deeper conversation. But it's a way of living for us versus a um, perfunctory behavior of shaking someone's hand. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, Church of the Resurrection is known all across this country for sure uh, in the area of hospitality. And can you share some of examples of how Church of the Resurrection does hospitality or radical hospitality and, and maybe both for people inside the church and outside the church? I might mention, um, <clears throat> Debbie's uh, exactly right about, about what that looks like. You know, one thing... Um, we might think about is if you're a friendly church, you're going to make certain that ushers and greeters are, uh, are doing their job and that they're doing that job really well. And there's a greeting for every individual who comes through the door. A radical hospitality is going to look like an entire community of people who know that everyone who walks through the doors is to be received and to receive by the church and really to receive, be received by God. And, and you think, you know, everybody in this room had a first time you walked through the doors of this church. And you were assert, received in a certain way. And extending that reception to others is really significant. And so part of what we talked about um, over Friday and Saturday were some things that the church might do. But at the end of the day, what's going to really matter are all of us together creating an atmosphere of hospitality. So um, we, we do some of the, many of the things you do. And we follow up with visitors and deliver. We deliver coffee mugs to our first-time visitors. Uh, we greet in the parking lots and at the doors. Well, part of what we've turned our attention to is the greeting that happens inside the worship space. And so we have uh, people who've, who've now um, agreed to become section hosts, uh, section leaders. And so they're developing community and hospitality and even inviting people into fellowship uh, together just in the section where they sit. And they say, the, you know, the 80 seats around me are my, this is my parish. And I'm going to create hospitality. And I'm going to invite people to dinner. I'm going to get to know them by name so that when somebody shows up to worship, they're going to be greeted uh, by name as often as possible. And that, it's that kind of hospitality woven through the church that we're aiming for in terms of radical hospitality. Okay. So I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to ask you to be thinking, are there some of you who would uh, either officially or not officially kind of take it upon yourselves? I'm not asking you for you to raise your hands. I'm asking for you to think about it. Would you be willing to kind of Take that area around where you're seated week after week and just use that as an opportunity to uh, greet other people, people who are first-time visitors, and make them 
feel very, very welcome. You may be doing that already, but for those of you that are not, maybe this would be something that uh, you, would, you would see as an opportunity. Debbie, have you got any examples that you'd like to share? That, uh, one of the things that we talked about this weekend were two simple rules, and they're just really easy to remember. And so we, um, when we were meeting with our leaders and our members, uh, we asked them to think about two things. One is what we call the three-minute rule. So the three-minute rule is an encouragement to us that when we first enter, that we take the opportunity to spend those first three minutes getting to know somebody that we don't know as well, greeting somebody that we're not as comfortable with because our tendency as humans, and including me being a 100% extrovert, is I'm going to gravitate towards people that I know better. And, um, but the three-minute rule says I'm going to get make myself uncomfortable enough just to go up and get to say, hey, how are you today? What would you think of that game yesterday? And get to have a conversation with somebody that I don't know as well. And usually what happens then is that extends beyond three minutes. So I might just encourage you to practice the three-minute rule um, or idea of that, not only here, but in your place of work or when you're at a school function or um, another community event that you're at. That's, you're extending that kind of radical hospitality beyond the walls of the church. The other idea that we shared uh, to the leaders that were gathered over the last two days was this idea of what we say is owning 10 feet. So that means every place that you go, you're attentive to the 10 feet around you, the 10 feet in front of you and to the side of you and behind you. Is there any person within that 10 feet that you notice maybe hasn't been greeted yet or um, that uh, maybe there's something, there's trash in that area that needs to be uh, looked at and taken care of? So those are just two simple rules that help extend this out. And you can imagine if all of us are owning our 10 feet around us, it gives us the opportunity to really be radically hospitable to all. And it's very important, I think, that we get those two rules correct. I thought it was very interesting. I was standing there when uh, one of the members of the church came up to Debbie, and, and he was talking about the fact, right after we had talked about the three- and ten-minute rule, he said, you know, I, I get the three- and ten-minute rule perfect, except I have it backwards. I spend 10 minutes with people in around three feet of me rather than three minutes with uh, 10 people or people who are 10 feet uh, away from me. So it's very important, three minutes with people uh, within 10 feet. You all have just built a beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. I've had the chance to, to worship in it. Some of us who are in here have had the chance to worship in it. It's a magnificent uh, sanctuary and, and beautiful facility. Uh, it was a process as you built that, as you went through all of the plans and as you built that facility. Were there things that you did in the area of hospitality? As you know, we're about to undertake a renovation project. In, in May, we'll be out of the sanctuary. The people in the sanctuary will be out, and, and the whole church will kind of be under renovation at that time. Were there things you did at uh, Resurrection that related to the area of hospitality during that renovation time or building time that w could help enhance hospitality throughout the church and throughout the community as well? Well, we spent, uh, as you could imagine, when we, we moved into a brand new sanctuary, so you're renovating your sanctuary, we had to rethink everything we do, and it's kind of a unique building, and so we spent years preparing for the kind of hospitality um, systems that would help invite people to the new space. But I think you're really asking even during that time of transition. And, and part of what we, um, we knew that, that God was calling us to do was to, to make every ounce of opportunity out of the invitational opportunity of the move into the new building. I, I imagine in this community, uh, there will be some expectation of what might happen with the renovation of your sanctuary, or at least some enthusiasm within this congregation, and maybe a period of invitation. And so part of what we tried to do is put in the hands of our people uh, tools and resources where they could invite their friends and their colleagues, their neighbors, uh, because, I mean, how many of you, um, the first time you came to Dunwoody, were invited by somebody or brought by somebody? But just by show of hands, how many of you were brought by somebody or invited by somebody? You can raise your hands a little more proudly. There you go. Uh, <laughs> so many of us really were brought to the church by someone who, who could speak to the ministries of the church and the impact those ministries have had. And so this may be an opportunity to really think about the extension of hospitality even beyond the walls of, of Dunwoody, out into the community. I think it also required some um, sacrifice on behalf of our uh, congregants who 
um, were living into this value of radical hospitality. And so what I mean by that is they had to give up something. Some of them had to give up the worship service that they felt most comfortable in, maybe the one that they had been in from the very beginning of when the church started. When Dan and I first started attending Church of the Resurrection, we had about 100 people in worship and had no idea that the church uh, would become the size it is today. And I think what has happened is that what we try to do is make certain that we remove any barriers that would keep others from being able to feel comfortable from the moment they walk into our doors. We don't always get it right, believe me. We're a church of non-religious and nominally religious people. And uh, when you are a church of non-religious and nominally religious people from the beginning who are on this journey of becoming deeply committed Christians, there are times that we, we have misses where people aren't as welcomed as they should be. But um, because our congregation and, and our people have said we want to live into this value of radical hospitality. Um, it means that uh, several of us have changed worship services many times to give up our seat to the times that are um, more favorable to others. We've changed styles of music to make room for new people, and that's something that Dan has helped lead our congregation through because we've changed our worship service times. I can't, I, I've lost count. We don't have enough digits uh, on our bodies to be able to tell you how many times we've changed worship service times, as well as styles of, of worship. So. Dan, I might meddle here a little bit. And uh, we, part of what we did very specifically was when we moved into our new sanctuary, we had a contemporary service that folded into our 9 o'clock worship hour in the sanctuary. Well, that 9 o'clock was used to a traditional form of worship. So now we had a 9 o'clock contemporary worship service and then a service that starts at 11 o'clock that's a traditional service. I know that's not familiar to you here. Don't know anything uh, about I, it. I'm, not, I'm sure you have no idea what that, what that feels like. But then you have a time then of transition uh, pretty yeah. quickly between two very different styles of worship in the same space. And uh, part of what I think we've been able to navigate through fairly, uh, fairly well is this opportunity for those who are in the contemporary service to, to provide hospitality and a warmth of expression towards those who have a very different style of worship and have a very different form of worship in the traditional service. And for the same thing to happen uh, from the traditional side, it's easy to say, well, this is the sacred music that I, you know, this is the form of worship. So I'm meddling here, but part of our hospitality in these times is to, is to have, um, have the unity of the church yeah. and to, to do the kinds of things that would be the sacrifices needed to transition from one service to another really fairly quickly. And I think you're on that journey yeah. here as we, well. Is we that right? are, and that's yeah. a great, great word. Let me... Uh, I'm putting myself in the place of, of some of the people here in the congregation, I think. And, you know, when you listen to the news, you kind of get this idea that people are just really resistant, really hesitant to uh, come to church, to be a part of a, a faith community. But what I think I've observed uh, at Church of the Resurrection and here at Dunwoody is that really people are hungry. They're they're eager to be a part of a faith community if it's a place where they're accepted, if it's a place where they find true community. Would you, would you say that's true? I mean, it's okay to say no, uh, but it, it, is, that, is that true, do you think? I believe it's definitely true, and what I believe that we're um, touching on right now, um, particularly when it comes to this idea of the difference between friendliness and radical hospitality, is that when we're a congregation that's extending radical hospitality, that person who's coming in here just seeking a word of hope, maybe community, uh, maybe um, they've just moved new to your community and they're looking for friendship or fellowship uh, with other people. Maybe they want their children to be a part of something um, and positive, and so they're, they think, well, I'll try the church for that. When they can come in here and from the very moment they feel welcomed and they feel like they belong, um, and that's beyond friendliness. Yeah. I felt welcomed there, I felt comfortable there, that's when we know that we are extending the church in the way Christ extended that kind of radical hospitality to us back out into the community. And that's what I've seen in our congregation that for many of our, our um, members and our, um, our congregants is that because of what Christ has done in our lives, and I can speak for I me, mean, I'm a lay person, um, and the ministries at Church of the Resurrection that uh, introduced my family and I uh, to Jesus Christ, it changed our lives. Mm. It changed the trajectory of a young couple in their 20s, and we're now well beyond that, and I'm even a grandma now, had to get that in. <laughs> Um, but our lives are different. My children's lives are different. My husband and our, our marriage is different. 
um, because of this church that had this value of radical hospitality that welcomed us. So how could I not want to make certain that I extend that to others? And that's the difference, I think, that you uh, maybe have seen uh, at our churches and why people are willing to make different choices in choosing worship services and things. I would love to sit here and continue this conversation. Josh, Josh tells me we're already out of time. Uh, and uh, so would you join me in thanking them again for being here? And, and uh, Debbie and Dan, please be sure to express to, to Adam and to your, your senior leadership uh, at Church of the Resurrection how grateful we are that your church itself has made it possible for three of their key uh, staff people to be with us this weekend. Okay? Thank you for the radical hospitality yeah. you've extended to us. Too, thank you. And, and we're looking thank for great things here. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, I, one more I, I want to close out this section by just telling a little bit of a personal experience that I had. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, last September, I was, uh, I went to Church of the Resurrection for their leadership institute. There were a group of us that all kind of went out there. And uh, at the close of the seminar, their pastor, Adam Hamilton, told about an experience that he had. He told how he carried in his back pocket all the time a, a pocket New Testament. And, and then he told about one time when he had to take a flight somewhere, he was getting on board uh, the airplane, and <clears throat> as he did so, he struck up a conversation with the flight attendant. And because of the direction the, the conversation took with the flight attendant, he decided during the flight to just mark some passages in his pocket New Testament that he thought would be helpful to her. And then as he was deboarding the plane, he took the pocket New Testament, and he said, listen... I don't know if this will be helpful to you, but I just want to give you this, this pocket New Testament. And, you know, she just was thrilled with that. Well, after sharing this story, he then did an interesting thing. He gave a pocket New Testament to all of us who were attending the seminar, and he challenged us. He said, I want you to take it. I want you to read it. I want you to get caught reading it. I want you to underline it. And he said, but I only want you to keep it until you run across somebody that you think might need it. So I took my pocket New Testament, and from the church, the group that I was with, we went immediately to the airport. We, just a few minutes after that, got on board our flight, and as I did, and I'm one of those, I'm one of those uh, passengers that I like to find my seat. I kind of settle in, and I either read a book or I watch the TV. I don't get into a lot of conversation, but no sooner did I sit down than the lady who was next to me struck up a conversation with me, and she was asking about me, and so I shared a little bit about myself, and I was trying to be cordial, and so I asked about her. I said, do you live here in Kansas City? And she said, no. She said, I live in North Carolina. She said, but I fly into Kansas City every two weeks. And she said, and she began to get real serious at this point. She said, my sister is dying of cancer. And I said, whoa. And so one thing led to another. And I knew I had this pocket New Testament in my back pocket. Tell you the truth, I was kind of hoping to keep it for a few days before I gave it away. <laughs> but uh, I just felt that nudging. You all have felt that nudging before. And I said, listen, let me tell you what. I've just been through, and I told her about the seminar, I told her about the pocket New Testament. I said, would it help if I just underlined some passages and gave this New Testament to you? And she said, I mean, she just lit up like a Christmas tree, and she said, I'd love that. Well, I spent most of the rest of the flight underlining passages like Psalm 23 and Romans 8 and John 14 and other passages that I thought might be a comfort to her and to her sister. And, uh, and as we were making our final approach into uh, the Atlanta airport, I just reached over and I gave it to her. And she explained to me, she said, you know, my sister doesn't have any room for God in her life right now. And she said, uh, I really believe 
that this is going to make a difference. And she said, thank you very much. Now, I don't know what became of that. Uh, maybe one day she'll visit Church of the Resurrection. And I hope she tells the story uh, if she does and comes and visits. But what I'd like to do at the close of this service, we're going to have communion. We're going to celebrate the sacrament together in a moment. And, and then, but as we close this service, the ushers are going to hand you uh, one of these pocket New Testaments. It's got the name of the church on the back of it. I want to invite you to keep it with you. Keep it in your back pocket. Read it. Underline it. But keep it only until you come across somebody that you think might benefit from it. Is that a deal? Is that a deal? Okay, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you have been so hospitable to us. We have no need but what you have met it. Help us to have that same spirit and to share it with those with whom we rub shoulders every day. And may this church be a hospitable church to the max. In the name of Christ, amen.